In modernizing the fleet for a potential conflict with China, the U.S. Navy is looking to accelerate the development and deployment of robotic ships. Brian Clark is a senior fellow and director at the Hudson Institute. Brian, welcome. Nice to see you. Thanks, Mimi. Great to see you. The Navy participated in um, the 2022 Rim of the Pacific exercises. Right. This is called RIMPAC. That was this summer. Before we talk about specifics, describe those exercises and what were the major takeaways? Yeah, so RIMPAC is the world's largest naval exercise. Uh, it brings together a couple dozen countries from mostly the Pacific region, a few, though, from outside. Uh, you know, some European countries contribute. Um, and you bring together you know, tens of thousands of sailors, uh, you know, several uh, fleets of ships, so a couple dozen and ships as well. Um, and they do exercises ranging from the simplest things, just you know, operating together at sea, avoiding collisions, all the way up to sinking ships with missiles and torpedoes. Uh, so it runs the whole gamut, um, and they operate with different allies and partners depending on their level of sophistication. You know, so for example, with the Australians and the Koreans, they'll have them, they'll do full on sink, sink exercises. And then with smaller allies, they'll do these sm smaller operations like amphibious landings. So the Navy is investing heavily in robotic ships. Right. Is that a wise investment in your view? I, absolutely. I, I think what we're finding is that um, the Navy needs to be able to distribute the fleet more to be able to create more targets for an opposing force to have to shoot at, like the Chinese. Uh, it creates more confusion for the Chinese in planning and decision-making processes. Uh, but more importantly, it helps the Navy to be able to do some of the operations in these really um, highly contested, high-risk areas where you may not want to put a manned ship uh, at risk. So uh, one area in particular is undersea. You know, I think we've long said that submarine are always going to be able to get in and be able to threaten an opponent's ships or, or uh, land bases ashore. Uh, that's not necessarily the case anymore. Other countries are investing in anti-submarine warfare the same way we have. Uh, and we have to start thinking about using unmanned uh, undersea vessels to go in and defeat some of those undersea defenses like SOSIS arrays that other countries might have to allow our submarines to get in. So I want to ask you uh, about an unmanned surface vessel right. teaming up with a destroyer, which is manned. Yeah. Uh, how does that work? What are the benefits of that partnership, so to speak? Yeah, so the Navy's looking at uh, unmanned surface vessels for a couple of different missions. So one is um, the unmanned surface vessel might carry missiles and act as essentially an additional magazine for that manned surface combatant. So the, the destroyer drives around, um, finds a target that it has to engage, uh, for, or finds an air threat that's coming in. It can use the missiles on that unmanned ship first uh, it, before it uses its own missiles to expand its capacity. And then when it needs to reload, it can send off the unmanned vessel to reload and come back. And the, the destroyer doesn't need to leave its station. Uh, another way it can use it is as a decoy or as a sensor platform. So it can send that unmanned vessel forward in the higher risk areas where it can act as a decoy to pretend like it's a ship and attract an attack and you know flush out the enemy. Uh, or it can go out there and be a sensor platform that extends the reach of the destroyer's sensors. And, and how would unmanned vessels um, enhance joint operations with allies and partners? Right, so I think a, a key area here is that um, right now allies are afraid of being left behind as the U.S. builds more and more sophisticated ships and aircraft. Unmanned aircraft and unmanned vessels are a great way for allies to be able to contribute because they can build um, platforms of similar sophistication as the U.S. can. So you think about the Reaper drones that we use um, in the Middle East. Those are That technology is available to multiple U.S. allies, and it's something that they could deploy that would be able to operate with U.S. forces and not feel like they're at a disadvantage or they're, they're a second-class citizen when it comes to these naval operations. So unmanned vessels are a great place where U.S. and allies can operate with the exact same equipment and conduct operations at the same level of uh, sophistication. Is this the future of naval operations? And, and is, is the Navy putting these unmanned vessels to, to their best use? Right. Well, uh, it is the future. I mean, we're already seeing multiple naval leaders have said they anticipate the future fleet's going to have uh, at least a third of its ships uh, be unmanned and at least a third to a half of its aircraft be unmanned. So we're definitely moving that direction uh, to get the scale and the, the sort of distribution of the fleet that you need. Um, the Navy has not really done a great job as of yet in deploying these systems. They recognize the need for them. They have a lot of you know, R&D programs going on, but they really haven't transitioned very many into operational use. And the Congress has been beating them up about it um, over the last several years of, of authorization bills and appropriations bills. So the Navy is working right now to come up with a more coherent strategy to match up what it needs uh, from unmanned vehicles and the level of technology that they have today and try to marry that up so that we're able to you know, get some of these systems out in the near term uh, as opposed to continuing their development into some future time when hopefully they can be more useful. 
And, and we talked about their use in combat. What about gray zone uh, operations, yeah. which is just short of actual combat? Right, so uh, you know, some unmanned vessels might be useful in gray zone operations. So you could see unmanned undersea vessels being used or vehicles being used to go and um, degrade an opponent's uh, sensor arrays or you know, uh, go and uh, interfere with uh, island building operations in the South China Sea. Um, with some level of deniability. Uh, but on the surface, unmanned vessels are maybe less useful because what it does is that they may, they're, they're vulnerable to being you know, hijacked essentially by an opponent because there's no people on board and they can't just have self-defenses that shoot whoever comes along. So an unmanned vessel is gonna be vulnerable in the gray zone to potentially being taken over by an opponent. So for that reason, the Navy's looking at an option where most of these unmanned vessels would be manned uh, during day-to-day -day operations. Um, and then they would take the people off when you go into a wartime situation. And really, Brian, all this is about uh, countering China. Right. Where is the Navy falling short currently when it comes to a, a conflict with China? Well, uh, I'd say that it's it's falling short in uh, you know, being able to maximize the ability of its submarines to do the kinds of operations we've traditionally planned for them to do. So dealing with undersea defenses that opponents are starting to field. Um, I'd say on the surface, they're, they're falling short in having this fleet of unmanned vehicle, unmanned vessels that can act as sensors or as decoys. Uh, and then most importantly, they're, they're falling short in the air, where they, they are now fielding an unmanned air vehicle that's going to go fly from the carrier um, and be able to do tanking. Um, but that vehicle could, could also do some of the offensive operations that the Navy needs to do at really long ranges. So that's an area where the Navy's falling short is in getting those systems out to the fleet. All right. Well, Brian, nice to see you. Thanks for coming Good in. Good to see you, Mimi. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.